afternoon, everyone. I want, first of all, to say my thanks to the Great College and uh, the University for this wonderful opportunity to, to be with you guys today. And uh, I have to have a little dress for my whole English. I'll try to, to do my best. So the, the subject of my talk is the media and the message, the Russian sensibility in Putin's times. And I'll start saying that as a Russian citizen, I am often getting asked different kinds of questions on the current situation in Russia and its different aspects, political, legal, moral, and there is a favorite brand of question, so to say prognostic, and in fact I was asked it just a day ago while giving a reading at PSU. It is, well, and uh, what will happen next? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not being a sociologist nor a futurologist, I can only wave my hands here. Or, of course, tell a joke. Uh, I was told uh, uh, once that it is bad taste in Germany to start to talk with a joke, but since we're in the US, I will tell you one. It goes like, uh, like that. Uh, can a woman become a president of Russia? And the answer is technically yes, practically no. Why so? Because Putin is not a woman. <laughs> So if the Russia's future was predictable and the authorities stick to this notion, it would be ages and ages more of Putin's time. There is one more joke about it. Putin is asked to write his will, his testament, and he hesitates, then he thinks it over, then he says why not, and leaves everything to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> but as we know, there is nothing predictable about the future, and especially in Russia. And uh, that's the focal point of a few thoughts I'm going to share with you. Not being a scholar, what I can offer is a mix of a report and a testimony. For uh, in the last 20 years, I was deeply involved in what was happening in the Russian media field. The big changes it was suffering, some of them involuntary and some result of constant efforts of the Russian state, are mirroring the changes in a way that Russian society is seeing itself and its place in the world. These multi-layered changes, which have completely transformed our notions of journalism as both a product and a profession, affect everyone. Nonetheless, the Russian situation is entirely unique. I'll try to explain it briefly in the hopes that my unhappy experience can serve to help understand the general whole this heterogeneous unity that makes up our contemporary world. I often have to think and speak about the systemic crisis that independent media outlets in Russia are facing. In contrast to the tectonic shifts that are happening in the Western media, this crisis is man-made, 100% man-made, and it is a result of deliberate efforts of calculated policy which over the 15 years of the Putin regime has led to more or less total substitution of classical media outlets by phantom or sham television channels, newspapers, internet projects, the sole objective of which is to imitate the existence of a free press under unfree conditions. Even now, against the backdrop of political and economic crisis, so much money is invested in the creation of these projects, that it could fund the budget of a small state. As the Brezhnev era uh, ideologue Mikhail Suslov was saying once, we don't skimp on ideology. <laughs> in this way, as in so many others, the realities of Putin's Russia are a parodic copy of its predecessor, the Soviet Union. The methods that were used to destroy the independent press are designed to dismantle, one by one, any and all publications that could compete with the phantom media. Describing it, I would use the term Zachistka. I guess you know it. It comes from the times of the First Chechen War, and uh, what, is, uh, what, uh, what it means is total demolishing of every human life uh, on a territory that the state is considering to be dangerous. This kind of zachistka, uh, while 15 years have passed, 
since the destruction of NTV, the leading independent television channel of the 90s. And in the meantime, the biggest television channels, publications, and even entire publishing houses has been shut down or forcibly reformed. How it was working? There is an example of Commerçant, the oldest and the most respectable independent publications, publication in post-Soviet Russia. It was enjoying an impeccable reputation for over 20 years. In 2007, the previous owners sold it to Alisher Osmanov, an oligarch with no former interest in the media field. And for almost five years, things were just going on. The editorial policy, the figures were staying the same. And then from December 2011 to 2013, the publication was going through a number of shock treatments. And it is not no, no coincidence uh, that it was happening in the framework of protests of the uh, 2012. Uh, they were seeking editors and general managers. They were closing and reshaping successful projects. They were pressing journalists to omit this and that and effectively destroying the whole. And now the publication is, well, sufficiently loyal and hardly reliable. Now the state's focus is on a new and, uh, well, complex task. It attempts to control the internet. The real picture of what, is, or of what has happened is this. Media, in my opinion, has essentially ceased to be a business. For the owners and investors, the risks associated with such dangerous properties outweigh the financial and reputational gain. Uh, the owners are looking to divest themselves of their media concerns, and they are making strategic and personnel decisions without even taking into, into account the business component. The journalism education, like the entire system of humanities education, is as good as destroyed also. And the professional standards are eroding or being done away with. The state media outlets essentially embrace the yellow press in every sense, organizationally, stylistically, and ideologically. A first and impressive example of that is the story of Life News, the yellow paper and a TV channel that for the last few years was sharing the managing, the working space, the sources, and even journalists with the Izvestia, a formerly respectable daily newspaper that now was managed by Aram Gabrielanov, who is always parading his loyalty to the authorities in a kind of a Kadyrov-like -like fashion. The media outlets that are controlled by Gabrielanov are known for publishing sleevy bits and pieces of information that the special services want to spread around. At the same time, Laws are being adopted at many levels that make a journalist's work practically impossible. There are laws on revealing sources. There are laws against the foreigners working in the media. Laws on foreign agents on undesirable organizations. Their name is, well, Legion. But what is at the stake now, above all, is the internet. And uh, first and foremost, the social networking which now fulfill the function of the news media when real media outlets cannot fulfill their functions professionally. But with everything I have detailed, the worst type of deformation that can journalism, in journalism, that, that can happen in journalism and to journalists is an internal deformation. In Soviet times, this was called self-censorship or the internal editor an inner entity that prevents you from saying the entire truth. This is a shaky moral situation when the decision whether to report facts has to be made anew every time, weighing not only the reliability of your sources and the, important, the importance of the information you have gotten, but also the problems that the publication of dangerous information can create for a publication and its employees. What they shut down the site or fire the editor-in-chief want journalists lose their jobs. As a result, journalists and editor, editors don't even need to be controlled by the presidential administration. They are already censoring themselves, constructing a difficult balance of truths, 
half truths and silences. Where there should be a single task, like finding and reporting information. A second, a contradictory one, arises. Interesting information is now dangerous. It needs not to be revealed, but to be concealed, or at least meted out in doses. Today, every Russian publication, especially the one that is working with social or political subjects, is risking the following. It could be instantly blocked without a court verdict if the content of the site would be considered extremist. It could be called a foreign agent if what you are doing is considered as a, to, to be a political activity. It could be sued by the authorities or private, or private persons if the content is viewed as obscene or worse, propagating homosexuality, which is a kind of a bad noir for the regime and its supporters. It could be suffocated financially by a number of penalties, costly legal proceedings, or simply with putting more pressure on the owners. And at the worst of it, uh, it censors itself constantly in order to avoid or minimize the risk. In this way, the entire media system is as whole as alien. It's just that someone is corrupted by money and power and the others fall victim to constant external arm twisting and internal censorship. What does this situation mean for the West? I guess that all the information that you are getting from the official or even unofficial sources need to be subjected to a careful reading and corrective. And above all, this affects the main information bubble of the Russian years, the myth of massive support for Putin, uh, the idea that Russia and Putin are one and the same. I mean, millions were spent to convince the West of this, and the reality is far from being so straightforward, but there are fewer and fewer opportunities to notice that. What does this situation mean for Russia? That in the very near future, there will be almost none remaining sources of information that can be trusted and that against the backdrop of a mass societal depression, a, grow, a growing economic crisis, and a complete lack of any prospects for the future. Uh, in essence, the country could return to Soviet standards, to times when the only way to find out what is happening in, a, in the country and the world was to look for hidden meanings in the official publications. The only, the only thing that can counteract this is a system of free, partisan media outlets. The authorities, as the experience of the last 15 years demonstrates, have their own logic of reaction. And they first go after everything big, judging mainly by the audience numbers. After everything that caves under direct pressure, ideally speaking, media has to be equal to an owner who can be controlled or who needs to be replaced. Publications that haven't been roped in the, into the smooth system of briefing and agreements, publications that don't participate in the presidential administration meetings, somehow fall outside of the authorities' comfort zone. To put it more bluntly, they'd rather not notice them. But now the balance of power is shifting. The small new style outlets with small budgets, with small staffs, with limited menu of services, often existing as and with the legal status of individual blogs, are on the leading edge, in the front row, so to speak, or at the frontier. They have no masters, they have comparatively small audiences, they are diversified, each one is trying to reach its own, relatively sparse niche audience, but the total, the overall audience of this eclectic group of sites is very big, and it's united by a mistrust for the official source of information, sources of information. Broadly speaking, the audience for this internet archipelago is made up of that official percents, uh, official 14%. Also, there is, uh, as I was saying already, a reason to assume that there were many more than that. And it is an interesting topic we don't have time to discuss. Could we rely? on the straightforward sociology in a country that is obsessively hiding the truth. 
I just read a news piece that was saying that 70% of Russia admitted that they are lying to the sociologists. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, what about the 30% who still do not admit that? <laughs> so, we are speaking about that 14% that didn't support Putin in the last elections. That subset of Russians who are politically conscious and active and ready for a productive dialogue with the rest of the world for whom this dialogue maybe was never interrupted. Uh, and this is a fairly new thing. For the first time in two and a half decades, independent journalism in Russia lacks a flagship publication. And if one appeared, it days would be numbered. It would be marked as enemy number one. And the situation demands work and responsibility from the reader also. Now he is becoming simultaneously an interpreter. And it is also demanding efforts to preserve the little that remains of the Russian media. It could become the beginning of a new phase. But contemporary Russia is sort of ambiguous about beginnings. And this is another layer of our complicated reality. There is a big global framework to view our local situation. And everywhere, not only in Russia, the idea of future is no more what it used to be. It is not something to aim for, or something to build together, or even something to hope for. In the best way possible, it is simply blank, and sometimes threatening, as the Hollywood movie productions with its range of anti-utopian movies is letting us know. But in Russia, this common feeling is much, much more intense, more widely spread, and I'd say more universal. This feeling is a something that everyone agrees on, from Putin to the opposition, from peasants to intellectuals. The future is something to be afraid of and something to be avoided, of, uh, avoided at any possible price. The question is how did it come to that? What would call into existence that sort of a common consensus? It is unnamed. It is hidden even from ourselves, but it still exists and unites all the stratas, all the levels of contemporary Russian society. This fear of the future, this agreement that it will only, on, uh, only make things worse, helps maybe to answer the other crucial question. How comes there is no Maidan in Russia? Why did the opposition stop where it did in, 12, uh, in, uh, uh, in 2012? But maybe the most urgent question that needs to be answered is a different one. What happened to the idea of future? What's so wrong with it? And uh, here is a few explanations that may help. I was uh, telling my friends about a brilliant, unpublished yet, paper of a psychologist I was reading back in Moscow. She works in the field of post-Freudian analysis and has rather a wide practice in Moscow. Her prices are not too high, so her clientele is somehow representative. There are different ages, different circles, different educational and social levels. But what is striking, and it is quite obvious in her work, is how alike, how in fact homogeneous these people are in a very special way. The work of an analyst is to listen to other people's dreams, <laughs> and that's what she does. And what is remarkable, that for the last 10 years, there is basically just one dream she is constantly hearing. Just one dream with one common plot, with little individual twists and turns, but nevertheless the same. I'll try to tell you the one that impressed me the most. Uh, the dreamer is a girl in her 30s. Uh, she comes from a well-to-do family. She, has, uh, she is educated. She's working in, uh, she lives in Moscow, she is working as a copywriter in a big advertising agency. And what, what she's telling is, uh, suddenly a new law is issued. And it says, the law says, that anyone who is losing his or her passport is to be executed, is to be killed. And she says, you know, I'm always uh, the one uh, things are happening to. I lose my passport immediately, and all my family is horrified. My boyfriend is crying, my sisters are crying. Uh, 
but my mother, she's the wise one in the family, uh, she said, don't worry, don't worry, it's not so awful, they will not kill you, they will just send you into an exile. And uh, that's exactly what is happening. The doorbell rings and the firing squad is entering and they are taking me away. But no, they do not kill me. They are placing me in, the, in a kind of a Skotsky wagon. It is also a special term from the Stalin's era, uh, describing a special, a special vehicle, a, a train carriage, uh, redone specifically to transport huge amounts of prisoners to the lagers. It has no seats or benches, whatever, uh, basically no windows, but you are able to, to gape into some narrow holes. And I'm sitting at the floor of the Skotsky wagon, and I'm looking in this uh, reverse window, and what I'm seeing is huge, huge, empty, wild, uh, white, remote fields passing by the window. And what I'm thinking is, of course, of course, I always knew that. That is something I was always expecting. I always realized that my, so to say, normal life, my uh, first kiss, my uh, students' years, my uh, children' toys, uh, my parents, my uh, pillow, everything was just a passing fancy. But this thing, that this Skotsky wagon, these planes are something that was expecting me. This is what I was born for. What it means, and there is a variety of that dream told by different people in different versions. What it means is, at the very roots of our everyday existence lies a deep belief that the reality is something you cannot rely at. Under each surface, there is an ugly sub-reality of what may happen. The real thing that always means treachery and death. Every turn of your life can lead you to total disintegration. The dreams say you never can rely on anything, even or maybe especially on your loved ones. In the dream world, the uh, scientist is describing mothers uh, mean also motherlands. And both of them never hesitate to betray you or kill you. And, well, I guess it's quite an explanation for anyone to wish to postpone the future for the longest time possible. Even if you understand on your conscious level that it is a simple mental construct, a result of decades and generations of lasting trauma that no one was working with, it is just too deeply rooted to be dismissed. So if you live in Russia, you feel you have no future, and that even your present is deeply flawed and compromised. And if you need to choose between them, sure you take the present. And that leads you straight to that informal pact, pact with the Putin's dogma, that makes you wish the history to end. And uh, as you remember when Alexander Kozhev was speaking on the end of history, and that eternal everlasting present, he was meaning something completely different. What he says is the state is to become so effective in terms of solving problems and fulfilling the needs of its citizens that the state and the citizen are to make a pact, thus permitting history to stop. And in a way this vision, yeah, it is grotesquely similar to that hidden pact that exists between the Russian state and, and its citizenships, citizenship. Sorry. But our pact is revised. It has a different base. What is said is not everything is perfect, so just let's stop on it. But it might be much worse, so let us stop. The state may be faulted or even failed, but we still agree to leave it like that, to prevent the further yet unknown catastrophe. But still the present time we are experiencing is so ugly, we are unable to face it. So we turn to the only thing that still seems stable, that's the time past. And what we see there is also quite unpredictable. From the Russian point of view, the past is a matter of fiction. It is not something stable or solid. It is subject to constant changes and revisions. After the 70 years of Soviet official history, uh, i.e. of rewriting the big narrative 
to make it serve the current situation. After all that years of erased memories, demolished portraits, rewritten textbooks, we know our, our lesson well enough. It says that history is also unreliable and there is nothing final about it. It is never about the truth. It's about what they want you to say to right now. And under the grand flow of the official history, like the deeper currents of another the secret history kept in the families, and you never know which story to choose. At that point, history becomes simply your story of choice. It turns into literature. For now, there is no point, no spot in the whole history of Russia, Soviet or even pre Soviet, that could unite all the people and became, become a base for a big consensus a historical text that would mean the same for all the people. Not Yeltsin, not Gorbachev, not Lenin, not Stalin, nor World War II, nor even Catherine the Great, and definitely not Perestroika or the Revolution. The past now still is a battlefield, always revisited and revised. The latest point of revisal is, tragically or comically, the story of the Russian decembrists, traditionally viewed by centuries as heroes struggling to save the country of slavery. Now they are almost officially treated as traitors, as the foreign agents, as one can see, for instance, at a brand new exhibition in Moscow Historical Museum, owned and uh, financed by the state. But still, the past, multi and fragile as it is, it still is the only narrative we can refer to and the only mirror we can face. So, the past is becoming a starting point for different eclectic remixes, for collages, for exercise in style, a source of false and of any meaning examples. How it works now is very visible in the world of official media. You see something that feels like a quotation, but you never know if it is forged or not. And if it is not forged, where does it come from? from the Russian 30s or 70s, from Pravda or Sturmer, when uh, the official newspapers are speaking about the fascists or the Banderts, uh, about the Banderts, they are just uh, meaning enemies. Uh, and uh, you can be sure if the author is using some uh, brand from uh, times past, he doesn't know where it does, uh, does it come from. And he doesn't really care. He simply thinks it sounds good. That mantra that everything is relative, uh, that most of the, uh, uh, that the mantra is that everything is relative. Um, and especially uh, the big Russian past that the authorities refer to and try to restore. It is a patchwork. A patchwork of misquotations and false evidences, and it is hybrid, as the war in Ukraine was. It has nothing to do with the truth, but they insist now that the whole concept of truth is old-fashioned. And this totally artificial version of the past is the picture of future that the Russian state is promising to its people. This obsession with the past is something very deep and private, but I I think, I'm sure, that our only chance of getting ourselves the future is to find a way to stop with it, to force us to see that the future, unknown as it is, is inevitable, whether we want it or not. Thank you.